Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm Jonathan Kay, speaking to you from Toronto. And if you're getting tired of my voice, this is the episode for you, because we're doing something new here on the podcast today, and my only role in it is to briefly explain what that thing is and then get out of the way. As some of you know, in late 2020, Quillette began collaborating with Think Inc., Australia's leading intellectual touring company, to bring you a monthly series of speaking events under the banner Free Thought Live. What you're going to hear today is from our inaugural event, hosted virtually from Sydney by Josh Zepps, who's been a longtime host at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, or as I call it, the other ABC. He's also a popular podcaster, a comedy writer, and at one point, the host of Australian Idol Backstage. Joining him is acclaimed Columbia professor and celebrity intellectual, I think I can call him that, John McWhorter, who will get his own proper introduction from Josh as I now bow out. To learn more about this speaking series, just Google Quillette and Free Thought Live. A huge hello to everyone around the world. We are live. I'm just looking at some of the places that people are joining us from. Seattle, New York, New Orleans, Ottawa, Melbourne, Portland, Oregon. That cesspool. I'm sorry. Hope you're doing okay. Nice in France. What time is it in Nice? It's after 2 a.m. in Nice. Go to bed. No, stay up and watch this. It's better. I hope everyone's doing okay in this insane time. We're in Sydney, of course. So I want to give a nod to the traditional owners of the land that we're on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and to any Aboriginal people joining us, and to your elders and ancestors, a big g'day. I'm stoked that we can all be here. This is the first ever Free Thought Live event. These are going to be something of a monthly occurrence. I'm so grateful to Claire Lehman at Quillette, as you know, the world's leading free thought magazine and to Susie Jamil at Think Inc., its leading intellectual touring company, for collaborating on this. Because when I think back to when the pandemic hit, my first thought was, what's going to happen to all these amazing events with Think Inc., with Jonathan Haidt and Cornell West and Douglas Murray and Jane Goodall? And the answer is, we are not going to let a little pandemic stand in the way of bringing you fascinating conversations with the world's most interesting minds. So here we are. You're part of it at the very beginning So thank you for being here. Briefly, who am I? I'm Josh Zepps. Some of you will know my old podcast, We The People Live. Some Americans uh, will know me as a founding host of HuffPost Live. Australians may know me as a host on ABC Radio Sydney or as the former anchor of the Weekend Breakfast Show on ABC TV. And a few of you may have seen one of my six appearances on the Joe Rogan podcast, which alone probably had a larger audience than everything else I've ever done combined times a trillion plus infinity. John McWhorter is one of America's leading academics and public intellectuals. He's a Columbia University professor who teaches linguistics and has taught American studies and philosophy and music history, but his real specialty is language. His podcast about language is excellent. It's called Lexicon Valley, and he discusses culture and race on The Glenn Show with Glenn Lowry on Blogging Heads TV, and you'll know his work as a contributing writer at The Atlantic. Please welcome John McWhorter. How are you doing, Josh? I'm well. Let's just start with how you are. We're all scattered all over this crazy world at the moment, unable to, to go and visit each other, and I, I do miss New York, and I think of it fondly, and I wonder how you're doing. Well, I'm fine. I have to teach my classes online, which requires reformatting all of them. And I have two small children. And in New York City, classes are half online and half in person. But when they're online for a five-year-old, it's utterly meaningless. So there's that. (laughs) And I'm trying to write linguistics articles for the academic linguistics community while also writing for The Atlantic and also writing a book that takes issue with the new woke consensus. And I'm trying to do all of that while also having some sort of spare time. And you know what? That is is better than being bored. But that is my life. I wonder, what does your five-year-old even make of an online class on television? Is it just like, this is much less interesting than Sesame Street and Peppa Pig. Why am I having someone talk at me? 
she has no blessed idea. It reminds me of one time when my eight-year-old, when she was three, walked in on me as if like I was doing something bad. I was watching an old black and white sitcom. She had never seen black and white TV, but she'd only seen color. Frankly, she'd barely seen TV. She'd only seen color things online. And I'm watching Sergeant Bilko, and she was just mesmerized at like why the colors weren't right, and I had to explain it to her. I think that's what my five-year-old sees, except it's school. It's yeah. just, it's the saddest yeah. thing in the world. And I think it's going to be that way for the whole school year. But you know, life could be much worse. There could be wildfires in California. So Don't even talk to Australians about wildfires in California. Man. Yes, We're that's looking right. at what's going on over there, and it's given me flashbacks to last summer, which was uh, God, that something of a, pre yeah. a precursor. So, I'm, again, my heart, heart goes out to anyone on the west coast of the U.S. who's, who's gone through that. All of those so, insane images that we're seeing of blood-red skies. I remember I remember it. I remember waking up, and every morning you'd have a, ca a you catch were there. in your throat. Because, yeah. yeah, well, I was in Sydney, yeah. Uh, and, it, it, you know, I would... Everyone was coughing. The whole sky was red. It was, uh, yeah, it was pretty horrendous. Anyway, let's talk about more positive things like cancel culture and the the racial apocalypse. Uh, can we yeah. just start? Let's just start with some terminology, I think, John, because as a linguist, I mean, one thing that you are is very precise about language and precise about meaning. And I think half of the problem that we have in the culture wars at the moment is that we're not necessarily even talking about the same things when we talk about things. Uh, what are we talking about? And you've written in The Atlantic about this. What are, we, what are we talking about when we talk about racism? Racism has become a really tough word. And the only way that I think I can help anybody is to remind all of us that, say, the ancient Greeks thought that there could be a healthy body or an unhealthy body. And that in the same way, you could have a society that was healthy or unhealthy and that there was an analogy. Racism starts as burning a cross on somebody's lawn or using the N-word. Then at some point in the late 60s, it starts becoming popular to think of racism as being a society where there are discrepancies in achievement or especially access to resources based on race. So the idea is that if there are those sorts of societal discrepancies, then the society is racist in the same way that a person could be racist. Now, nobody was thinking about ancient Greece when they came up with this new definition. No one came up with it. It was something that drifted into the general consciousness because it's our nature to use metaphor. But as a result, we have this word where we're taught early on that racism means that you are a racist person. Then you're supposed to learn later, and it's not as if usually you're taught this explicitly in school, but you're to learn later that there's something called systemic racism, where of course it isn't that a system can be prejudiced or a bigot, but that because there are these inequities, it is racism, and that therefore we must think of it as somehow akin to someone burning a cross on someone's lawn. That's hard. And I think as a society, we're gradually mastering it. Words have a way of covering a lot of semantic space, and sometimes it can be challenging how much. But I must say that one thing about our current disputes about race is that, unfortunately, the word racism has had a rather eccentric trajectory. And it's important to realize it wasn't deliberate. It's not like somebody's trying to pull the rug out from under our feet, trying to confuse us, trying to be manipulative. Language never behaves. But in this case, we almost wish it had, because when you tell somebody, well, this person is suffering from institutional racism, they say, well, how is an institution racist? Or if you say you're supporting white supremacy, which is really now a synonym for institutional or societal racism, you say, well, what does that mean? I haven't burned a cross on anybody's lawn. I haven't called anybody the N-word. I see all people as the same. And, you know, they probably don't, but they think so. And you're telling them they support white supremacy. And what the person who says that to them is referring to is the fact that it can be harder for a black person to get a really good mortgage as opposed to a white person. The black person's mortgage isn't quite as good. Or black people often have trouble getting health care as good. Or there aren't as many black people in scientific disciplines. That is now considered to be a kind of racism. It's a tough semantic splotch. However, we can't get rid of it. There's no way that we can make people stop speaking the way they do. That 
almost never works. And so we just have to work with what we've got, but it is uniquely challenging. When you say we can't make people stop talking the way they do, I mean, one thing that we can do is is sort of accept perhaps even the term. I'm sort of thinking about whether or not, like, let's start with this. Could we have different words relate that, that relate to, that refer to structural or institutional racism on the one hand, and the biases that we all hold towards other groups of people on the other. Because I sometimes feel the conflation of those two things. Like the other day I was doing a story on the radio about a new citizenship test which the Australian government is introducing for people who are becoming Australians. Uh, And we were talking about some of the communities that it's probably targeted at. For example, hyper-conservative people from Muslim communities uh, abroad that might be more sexist or homophobic uh, than than Australians. And I said this on the air, and of course someone accused me of being racist for saying that, for presuming that a a Muslim migrant might tend to be more conservative in their outlook than an average Australian. And I said, well, it's not racist. And they said, you just don't know what what racism means. I mean, it is. You're just being a sort of a stickler. Like I was sort of being a pedant for, you know, some linguistic specificity that didn't get to the heart of what I really knew that they meant. And what I suppose they knew that I meant was that I was making a generalisation. And I was guilty of making a a generalisation. Could there be a different word for, like, rules of thumb that have racial or ethnic uh, overtones versus the institutions of the prison industrial complex and the uh, and, you know the structures that keep African American down in the states. Josh, that gets really hard because you know if I could wave a magic wand, we would have one word for I'm not going to say Archie Bunker because I don't know how much the 50 year old sitcom All in the Family played in Australia, <laughs> but you know an overt racist. That person it, that person was called prejudiced back in the day, and racism racist kind of crept in starting in the 80s. We could call that prejudice then we could say that there is societal racism and that would refer to these discrepancies. But what you're talking about is something in between, which is that we are to suppose, and here's where I do get impatient. I mean, there's linguist me and then there's quote unquote race pundit me. And I try to keep them separate, just like I don't like, you know, ketchup and scrambled eggs, keep them separate. But sometimes it's a little awkward. And if you cannot make those sorts of generalizations, And if you can't make them without it being clear that you know that that doesn't apply to every single member of the group in question, but you want to make generalizations and you're told that it's racist to make any kind of generalization, that's based on a myth that's being pounded into us these days, that people are all individuals and that there's no such thing as group traits, except the new idea is that you're allowed to depict white people, especially male heterosexual white people, but white people in general, as this roiling, malevolent mass of alternately rapacious or clueless people. So you're allowed to qualify them, but you're not allowed to say anything about any other group of people except that they are oppressed by this white hegemony. Now, we all know that that's ridiculous and that there is a such thing as cultural traits. There is a such thing as tendencies within cultures. But these days we're being told to pretend that the only culture that we can attribute traits to is white people, unless we are talking about the trait of having to deal with the shit that white people give us. So the idea is that what unites all black people, for example, in America, is not any particular traits. Say anything about a fondness for dancing, and I know this from experience. Say anything about a fondness for fried chicken. Sorry, folks, it is there. And if you don't believe it, then notice how if you go to a black function, they are more likely to serve fried chicken than a white one. Anybody who thinks that isn't true doesn't spend much time with white people. But if you attribute any traits to any other culture, you are stereotyping, you're a racist, except that what I and all other black Americans supposedly are defined by is that the cops don't like us and white people think that we're children. I think that that's a rather unempirical view of what life is actually like in America or anywhere else. But these days, people with 160 IQs are telling us that this is the new wisdom. This episode of the Quillette Podcast is brought to you by Skillshare, the online learning community that offers you the chance to learn new skills in a more structured and supportive way than you can get from just watching how-to videos on YouTube. 
none of us really know what 2021 will bring, but if you want to make the most of it, whatever it brings, consider joining up at Skillshare to develop your talent, learn new skills, and make yourself more marketable. If you surf the Skillshare site, you'll find that a lot of the most popular topics involve exploring your creative side, such as graphic design, logos and branding, photography, illustration, and creative writing. But you'll also find a lot of stuff that's more off the beaten path. For instance, I've spent a lot of time on Skillshare trying to get better at chess, and I love the fact that all of the material is action-oriented. There's always a project or a goal, and you're part of a larger group of other Skillshare members supporting you as you learn the material. Explore your creative side at Skillshare.com slash Quillette. That's Q-U-I-L-L-E-T-T-E. Skillshare.com slash Quillette and get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. Thank you to Skillshare for supporting our podcast. And now back to our show. I have to take umbrage uh, to your remarks about uh, fried chicken because you clearly haven't met my uh, Cuban-American mother-in-law who absolutely adores fried chicken. John, let's just bring the world together around fried chicken. In this crisis, can we all just agree that fried chicken is delicious? Best food in the world. Everybody should know. Uh, to what extent does a person's lived experience, when you're talking about the difference between... Like, what you're talking about is sort of a moral standing to be able to talk about these issues. And we have sort of mm-hmm. lost... You know, white people have lost the ability to talk about these things because we don't have you're moral not standing. You're not allowed. Because we don't... Yeah. But there is a kernel of truth in that, which is that I have never had the experience of racism and I have not suffered racism. So, so to some extent i don't have the you know the buzzword is the lived experience of uh, of this and this sort of came to a head in in my career when i i did a the most listened to episode of my old podcast was when sam harris and joe rogan and hannibal burris and i all got in at joe's studio and started we're talking. all together we were all together oh, Jesus. <laughs> you should you wow. should listen to it john it's quite I, actually I it's not even publicly available anymore but i'll put it out at some point anyway the point was that sam and hannibal who was quite drunk at the time got into a big argument about whether or not uh, Sam, a white person, essentially has standing to talk about police statistics, to talk uh, about the statistics of violence against African Americans, uh, because he doesn't have the lived experience. And there's a sort of a belief that without the experience of truly understanding how repeatedly demeaning it is to have to deal with law enforcement in the United States as a black American, for example, you, you don't really have a leg to stand on when you're talking about what policy should be. And I think about my grandmother, who was a, a European Jew who was hunted by the Nazis and then came to Australia as a refugee. And for the rest of her life, that didn't actually give her a more nuanced understanding of anti-Semitism. It, it actually blunted her understanding of anti-Semitism because she saw anti-Semitism absolutely everywhere. What role does a person's lived experience play in their understanding of prejudice? Well, you know, here is where I'm going to give you the clip that's going to get around where I'm depicted as an asshole. But I'm going to give you honesty, and nobody's ever asked me that so directly. Yes, there is a lived experience, and I can tell stories. Things happen to me now and then. They happen. But a great many black people are vastly exaggerating the extent to which racism touches their lives. And I know what happened to George Floyd. I know what happened to all of these people. And frankly, folks, I can take those statistics back to the 90s. I pay very close attention. However, the idea that to be a black person, including a black man, is to walk out into the streets and be ever at risk of being either abused by a cop or treated in a starkly inferior way by a white person is a lie. And I'm sorry to say that, but I think that an awful lot of Black people today are taught to pretend that that's the case out of a sense of allegiance with our race, out of a sense that white people need to be taught a lesson. And I get it. I can put myself in their heads. I try very hard to. But frankly, many people are thinking, what about what happened to George Floyd? And as I've said in the pages of Quillette, the idea that George Floyd died because he was black isn't true. The facts don't support it. It looks like it. And if you had asked me even as recently as four years ago, I would have said That must be it. And I argued that with my sparring partner, Glenn Lowry. He and I disagreed about the cops. We're thought of as these apostates. But I always said with the cops, Glenn, there's no disagreement. But it's not true. For any death that you see like that, that the cops inflict on someone, and there is a problem with the cops, but I hate to say 
it's not as racialized as people say. You have to remember that that same thing almost undoubtedly happened to a white person, often not long before, and we never heard about it. And so what happened to George Floyd was absolutely egregious, but it had happened to Tony Timpa just four years before. And the common answer that black people are killed disproportionately to our numbers, even that doesn't work. Because really what it comes down to is one, and I don't like talking about this because it's so unpleasant, it's about how much crime people commit. And unfortunately, for reasons I think we can all understand, black men in particular commit a disproportionate amount of crime. That can't be denied. Or two, getting, getting into problems with cops is also predicated on socioeconomics. More black people are poor, disproportionately, and that is a grievous error in our society in itself. But if you're poor, then you're more likely to have warrants, you're more likely to be armed, you're more likely to do all sorts of things through no fault of your own often. But that means that you're more likely to encounter the cops. Well, you know, more black people are poor. So what all this means is that the definition of the black experience in the United States is not that for no reason whatsoever you go out into the streets and because white people don't like black people, a cop might push you up against a wall and the cop might kill you. It's simply not true. And it's interesting, my friend John Wood, who is um, becoming somebody who's on the list of black apostates lately. He's, he, is, you know, he, he, he knows his stuff. He grew up as a black person in a disadvantaged black community. He's not some buttoned up conservative elderly person. He, he, he's the shit. And he said that in his efforts to try to get the word out in the black community that we need to think about something other than the occasional idiot cop who does something really bad, is that he says he talks to black people who are very upset about the cops and he says, okay, so who do you know who got killed? And he can barely think of a time when anybody he spoke to, and he's spoken to a lot of people, said, well, I know somebody. Now, they all know somebody who was unfairly treated by a cop. The statistics show that the cops are meaner to black people. But do they kill more black people? They just don't. When you factor in criminal records, criminal behavior, and especially socioeconomics, it's just that the cops kill out of racism isn't there. Isn't there. So we're told that you can't you can't know the black experience with the idea being that someone like me walks out into the streets and I have to goad myself against racist treatment. People exaggerate vastly. When you see on social media, a middle class, especially black person who says, I encounter racism every day. Frankly, no, they don't. They're exaggerating. Do you encounter nasty treatment by the cops on a regular basis? It depends on your neighborhood. Do the cops kill you because you're black? Frankly, no. Are the cops mean to you? That is something that we need to really, really work on. Is that the experience of most black Americans in the United States? Once again, no evidence suggests that it does. And so if white people bristle at that idea that if you are white, you can't say anything about race because you haven't had the experience, as if black people now are Jews in Weimar, Germany. It's a vast exaggeration. Nobody is consciously trying to manipulate. There's a very complex dynamic going on in the black community where we're encouraged to have a certain sense of cultural fellowship. We are encouraged to not forget the people who we left behind. All of this is perfectly understandable, but unfortunately, a byproduct of it is that we are taught to exaggerate. It doesn't mean racism doesn't exist. I could give you some stories, but I'm going to stop here. But no, our experience is not what we're being told. And that includes with the cops and murder. And frankly, that untruth is at the heart of why the race discussion in the United States right now is at the impasse that it is. John, you just said if, if white people bristle at being told that they're not allowed to comment on racial issues because of the color of their, their skin. It's interesting. I'm not sure many white people are bristling, at least not overtly. Uh, I, I see a much more widespread co-option of this ideology amongst my circles of white friends, actually, than I do amongst my black friends, which is a peculiar thing, and certainly more than the number of white friends willing to confess publicly that they're troubled by any of it. Some do in some do quietly, but uh, but you know quite frequently it'll I'll, I'll just hear the the mantra 
that we're not supposed to talk about this stuff. I can't possibly comment on, you know, uh, what, for example, our policy towards administering hormones to teenagers who say that they're in the wrong sex body is because I'm not trans, so I don't have any or many standing to even have that conversation. That is an extremely common refrain that I hear across all of these hot button tripwire uh, issues at the moment. Uh, in your new book, you, you call this uh, this sort of orthodoxy, I believe, the elect or these people who believe this. Can you sort of articulate the way that you contextualize uh, this mindset? I have been titling a certain new orthodoxy, the elect, which I think of as quite literally a new religion, not like a religion. I'm not trying to score a rhetorical points so the Atlantic will publish my pieces. I <laughs> see myself as watching a new religious creed, a borning. Maybe as a linguist, I'm aware that we don't always apply the labels to things that we would in other circumstances, but it's, it's a religion. And the elect are people who, and it's not everybody on the left. It's not all liberals. Liberals are a subsection of the left. It's not all woke people. It's a kind of person who's willing to allow obvious suspensions of disbelief in the name of demonstrating that they're not racist. And so it's a certain extreme kind of ideology, but that extreme has now been become increasingly common. And I can only say that I meet white people who are genuinely under the impression, some of them I would call elect, as in they would beat somebody over the head for you know, not understanding their white privilege. Some of them are just scared. And what's really bothering me is how many white people I see are just scared and pretending. There is more mendacity in the way educated people in America talk to each other now than I have ever seen in my 54 mm. years. But that kind of person genuinely thinks when they deal with me that I can't get a cab. Frankly, that has not been true in New York City in any way for 20 years, and I've lived here for 20 years. I've always, I put my hand up in the air, sometimes when I don't put my hand up in the air, and I look nothing but black. <laughs> it was a problem, but there is a past and there's a present. It's not a problem. But I've had people who really think that they have to come get a cab for me. They really think that I'm dealing with all sorts of nonsense in stores, that I'm being diminished in all sorts of ways, and it makes me feel like they think that I'm a baby, they think that they have to pity me. And you know, if I was going through that, if it was 1950, okay, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd be grateful that they understood. If it was 1970, I'd be grateful that they understood. If it were 1980 fucking five, I would understand what they meant. And I was alive and almost mature in 1985. But today I think they've been misled. They wanna pat me on the head and give me a hug for all the racism I'm dealing with when I encounter racism that anybody would have cared about until about five minutes ago, about two times a year. But it, so I mean, isn't, isn't that the thing, John, John, that it doesn't even have to be tethered anymore to actual real world racism. I mean, you know, the concern, as long as you assert that you've been offended by something, then the onus falls on the person who was doing the offending to grovel and apologize for it, regardless of whether or not there's any any rational reason. I mean, you've written about these examples where people will make mouth sounds accidentally, like you wrote about this weatherman who accidentally had a slip of oh, the tongue yeah. when he was saying Martin Luther King. And then there was this case of a professor recently who was fired for saying a Chinese word that sounded a bit like the N-word. Uh, and so now it's not actually even a claim, I don't think, anymore about white people feeling like they have to be... And I don't want to just say white people. I mean, because this is something that affects... That is m more frustrating for my black friends than it is for my white friends, actually, because we can, you know, we can sort of ignore it. Whereas for, whereas for my black friends, they constantly feel like they're being spoken for uh, by, uh, by the elite. But uh, so talk to us about offendedness and how we should think about that. I just had a conversation with a white colleague who was saying, you are completely mistaken if you think there is any response to someone saying that they're offended. Because if they're offended, then by definition, what you said was offensive. It's almost a tautological loop. Oddly enough, just by chance, the first time I heard that argument was in 2003. It was, it was an Australian woman. I first heard that from an Australian and then it heard it from America. I don't I'm think sorry. I apologize on behalf of no. my countrymen for spawning such a thing. <laughs> okay. When you were saying it, I just thought it sounds like that woman. But <laughs> no, it's, um, this is the hard thing. And I'm writing chapter six of this book. And I need to say something about this book very quickly. I keep on talking about this book and talking about it on social media. And that book exists. I'm, I'm looking at the laptop that I'm writing it on right now. But 
That book has not been sold to a publisher. I'm writing it in one big burst so that no publisher want, can change it too much. So it's not that that book has a pub date or anything like that, but that book is going to exist. Anyway, chapter six started coming out of me this afternoon. And it's one of the hardest things because of what I'm trying to get across is the really sad thing, which is this. If we're going to deal with this new ideology and come out of it as a society with a genuine and honest culture of intellectual and moral engagement. We're gonna to have to become more comfortable with calling black people on their occasional bullshit. And to soften that, I'm gonna say our occasional bullshit. I'm not trying to disidentify. But there are times when black people are out of that sense of cultural fellowship that they feel lying. And so, for example, you referred to this case of the poor, white professor who's talking about hedges in different languages. And it turns out that in Chinese, one of them is naga. And frankly, as often as not, it's nega. It sounds even more like the N-word. I live in a neighborhood where the neighborhood next door, you can walk through East Elmhurst and you're listening to people saying nega, 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 nega all the time. You can't help noticing it. And I've heard black people making jokes about that. But you're thinking, what is the likelihood that they're actually talking about black people? They're just saying like, 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 like. Yes, it means that, 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 that. Some people have corrected me on this. But what it means is like, like, like. Now, a group of black students at the University of Southern California claimed that it injured them to hear him say that word exactly three or four times in passing when he was really talking about the whole general topic. And you know what? No, they weren't hurt. Because if we allow that they were hurt, we're disrespecting them. If they heard a phrase in Chinese over and over again that happens to sound kind of like the N-word, and it really made them go home and lick their wounds and take a shot of bourbon, they need therapy. There's something wrong with them. But, uh, and but there's isn't, nothing uh, isn't that condescending as well, John? I mean, isn't that, isn't that sort of accusing people of having a kind of a, a false consciousness? Like, if the, if the hurt was felt then I'm not saying that they're right about saying that the person who said it was in the wrong or should be fired, but it doesn't mm -hmm. make a lot of sense to me to say that the hurt isn't there because it's silly. No, they weren't hurt. They are <laughs> strong, smart people who were looking for a reason to be hurt. Somebody says, well, in Chinese, people say naga, 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 and then blah, 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 blah. If that hurts you, you need help. You need medicine. You need to be put in an asylum for a little bit and, you know, taught how to deal with real life. And now, a brief shout out for another podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show, which you can find at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You've heard me talk about Jordan's podcast before, and you know that Apple named it one of its best podcasts in 2018. But if you haven't given it a listen, let me just tick off some of the guests this guy has managed to get. Bob Saget. Malcolm Gladwell, Dennis Rodman, Mark Cuban, and the late Kobe Bryant. And if you tune in regularly, you'll know that this isn't just a parade of famous people. Jordan also finds folks you've never heard of, who just happen to have fascinating stories. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R. And now, back to our Quillette podcast. Let's take a more borderline case then of the actual of the actual word because I just want to tease this out. I think it's really interesting the the specifics here about how we all how we can all get along without seeming unreasonable to one another. Um, so years ago, when I just started doing my old podcast, We the People Live in New York City, we'd get a few people in a bar in Brooklyn, and and uh, an audience would be there, and we'd have a sort of a panel show where we'd drink cocktails. And Camille Foster, who you may know, who's a friend of mine, started doing the show, and there was an episode. My yeah, there was an he's great. There was an episode with him and a, a, bu a bunch of other black friends, and we were talking about the use of the N word. And we didn't, we decided not to use the phrase the N word. This was, I guess, probably in maybe 2015 or something. So there was a slightly different valence then already. I think it's shifted since then. Uh, and I, among them, in the context of a boozy conversation in New York amongst friends, would talk about the word, obviously not use the word as a slur, but talk about the existence of the word and when it can and can't be used and so on. Uh, and then last year I was doing a show at the Melbourne Comedy Festival and I got a call from the ABC, which was my employer, and they said, "There's a we've just got a request from one of the big newspapers here. They're doing a story about public 
uh, people who work for the public broadcaster in Australia and the boundaries of what they can say, and they've come across this episode, uh, and they're going to want to quote from you about that. And this got written up, uh, and then there was a whole lot of backlash internally into my personal email with people saying, you're just looking for an excuse to say the word. I see you. I see through you. I see what you're doing. Uh, people saying the point is you can't use that word because it's our word. And I don't believe that there was no hurt there. I think there was hurt. I don't think I was capable of responding to it plausibly. I didn't know whether I should respond to it plausibly because in a sense I was in the wrong and I'd caused it. But is that a more interesting case than the Chinese word? All I can say is that we have to think about one time versus another. And it's easy to live within your own time, but to fully understand issues, you have to think about another time. And I don't mean 1650, I don't mean even 1950, but we have gotten to the point with that word where we are treating it as word magic. We are treating that word with taboo in the way of, funny to say it in this context, but it reminds me of various linguistic practices of indigenous groups where certain syllables, certain sequences of syllables are just not allowed to be uttered. And that is what they do. And the truth is that, you know, here we are with the N-word and we are treating it exactly like that. And unlike with the indigenous groups, I'm not sure why. Because, and here's one of those things, I'm 54. And the funny thing about being in your 50s is that by that age, you can remember what now qualifies as another time when you were a fully mature person. So this is not me trying to be the old man saying, get off my lawn. But I know that in 1995, the very first radio interview I ever did, the first time I did media, I remember I had like, I was so excited. I had no idea that I would keep doing it. But somebody asked me to talk about the N-word. And they didn't ask me to talk about the N-word. They asked me to talk about nigger. That's what they said. And the general assumption was, you can say it if you're not using it. That's what we thought. I had a PhD then too. So did the other two people who were on the show. There were white people. There were black people. I still have the cassette. I've gone back to it recently just to make sure we use the word. You know, we were referring to it. We didn't use it too much, but we could say it. And nobody batted an eye. This new idea that you're not even allowed to say a word that sounds like it so we all probably remember the niggardly controversies that are actually 20 years old now, but that a professor can't even say naga, naga, naga in Chinese without being suspended from his course for the semester. All I'm saying is that's new. That is not the way black people felt, including leftist radical black people as recently as 25 years ago. What was so different about 1995? And remember, in 1995, we were living at the end of time, just like we are now. This is after OJ. 1995, I still got clothes I was wearing in 1995. <laughs> I can still fit into them. So if we were at the end of time then, what's happened now? It's exaggerated. I don't like it. Now, I, I knuckle under, you have to choose your battles. I'll talk about the N word. But I remember when I could say nigger, and it was okay, and not nigger, no, I didn't have to be vernacular about it. You could refer to it. That was I normal. I mean, it's, it's so funny, because yeah, I even, like, even I, just your saying it here, like, hits me in the chest as a white person who's lived in the States. It wouldn't have in 1995. No, and that's the funny yeah. thing. It, look, it didn't in 2012, because I can remember when I started working at HuffPost Live, we were doing a segment that was my idea about the N-word, because I just thought it was interesting, because where I came from in Australia, you were able to say it if you were talking about it in conversation. I think people gave people a little bit more latitude, and I had a conversation with yeah. the executive producer who said, uh, I said, can we just talk about it? And he said, listen, just think about what it could look like if someone took all of the clips of you saying it and put them back to back into a montage, and then you decide. So Which thank God he gave me that advice because I took it and I didn't say it. But, uh, but my assumption at the time, John, was that, look, in the future, people are going to look back on this and we'll be in a less racist time and therefore it will be less toxic to talk, to use that word that word is incredibly hurtful precisely because there is still racism as we become less and less racist we're going to be able to discuss the use of that word because it's not going to be so hot and what's happened oh, is the Josh, reverse 
Can I interject that Please. there's another thing about that word, which is that it makes me feel like I'm in the down position for a reason that I don't quite understand. There's this idea in the black orthodoxy these days that there's supposed to be this word where if anybody says it, or if anybody says a word that sounds like it, we're supposed to fall to pieces. Don't say that word because it reminds us of slavery and it reminds us of Bull Connor and Birmingham, Alabama, et cetera. If you say it, we're gonna cry, we're gonna pound on our bed, et cetera. I don't think that's black power. That feels weak to me. I remember, I'm pretty sure there's only one time somebody actually aimed it at me. And I was in, a, in an argument. There was a, frankly, working class, unemployed, drunken, white guy who was making a lot of noise outside of my apartment. I'm 28. And he wouldn't stop making noise. And he's fighting with his girlfriend. It was like the honeymooners is outside of my apartment. And it was like three in the morning. And I decided, he really was like, it was like, Alice! They were doing that. <laughs> and I just, I couldn't sleep. So I, I walked out and I said, could you please be quiet? And I tried very hard. And he gave me trouble. And so we went, got, kind of got into it. And I knew what was coming. Finally, I said, all right, Rob, that's it. That's it. And I turned around and I thought, I know what's coming. And he said, just a fucking nigger anyway. You know, I'm this educated. That's the sort of thing this person says. Mm -hmm. And I went to sleep. About five years later, I looked back on that and I thought, oh, I was supposed to cry. I was supposed to write an editorial to the Oakland Tribune or something. Didn't hurt me. Frankly, I felt better than him. Mm -hmm. I wasn't yelling at my girlfriend out on the balcony at three in the morning. I was much more upwardly mobile <laughs> than him. Why would it hurt me? And I think that's the situation with most of these situations where somebody uses that word. But no, apparently I'm arrogant to have not felt injured by that jackass. I don't think that makes any sense. And I know that there are millions of people who are listening to me saying this who are going to tell me that I'm getting something wrong. And frankly, I don't agree. And I think that more of them need to really think about not letting white people get to you. That's what people understood. 50, 75 years ago. Don't let them win. No offense, Josh. Let's just zoom out because I, I want to I double back to something you said earlier, which is that now that you're in your 50s, you've sort of got the perspective and and on one, the one hand, you've got perspective, but on the other hand, you've got the liability of being called a crotchety old man oh, oh. on your porch, waving your cane at the young kids, telling them to get off your lawn. What about that, that critique of all these culture wars? I mean, zooming out a bit from just what we're talking about now, which is, which is that there's always been pushback. Every advance, every social... You could rewind this conversation to the 1960s and we, could, we would have archetypes who are playing the roles of the people who don't like what's going on and who think that young people are misguided and they have to pull up their pants and get a job and that, that you're falling into the same thing that people in their 50s always have. Like, I mean, a good example of it is at the beginning of this, this introduction, I acknowledged Indigenous people in Australia... 10 or 15 years ago in Australia and still to this day in the United States, that's a bit clunky and awkward and like a little bit vomitous. I, imagine, I could yeah. sort of imagine a lot of the our American viewers hearing me do that and go, oh God, here's this woke white guy, you know, saying, oh, thanks to the indigenous people. But you know what? 10 or 15 years ago, that was the case. Now it's so de rigueur in Australia. It's just a new normal. It would be a, it would be a comment to not do it. It's just what you do when you're starting yeah, yeah. things. You just give a nod to the fact that there were people here for 60,000 years and that, you know, it's just a nice way of saying, okay, we're all, we're all in, this, in this together. This is the march of progress. And, you know, how do you make sure that you're not the guy saying, why are we doing all this silly stuff when it was so much better when I was young? Yeah, yeah. I, you have to watch out for that. And I try so hard to stay on top of what people generations below me are thinking. A major thing about me is that I'm not afraid to have people hating me, et cetera, but I try very hard to put myself in other people's heads. I am less likely, I think, than some of my comrades to think, oh, they're just being manipulative, they're just being cynical. I try to think most of them seem to be normal people, they're putting butter on their corn, You know, they're raising their kids. How can you be a normal person and think this way? And I try to wrap my mind around it. And so, yeah, you have to watch out for that. And I think that this is something where if it sounds like it's an old man, it isn't. This, this sums up the whole civil rights movement since 1966. There's this idea that for black people, the rules have to be different. And so various people came to this country 
and they were thought of as animals and they clawed their way to the top. Irish, Jewish people, Italians, they did it. But apparently black people, because of the history of slavery and also because we're darker complected, we can't be expected to do that. Now, it certainly would have taken us longer if we were just left to do it and there was no civil rights victory. But still, the idea is that we can't be expected. And I think that this is what I mean by trying to get into people's heads. I think that a lot of people today are thinking we need to wrap our heads around a new way of looking at what a society can be, what progress can be. So maybe black America could claw its way up from the bottom. But why should it be that way? Why don't we change standards of what we think morality is? Why don't we change standards of what we think it is to be intelligent? Why don't we change standards of what it is to be a physicist? Let black people into STEM subjects and change what it is to be allowed into a STEM subject. Let us change what music theory is supposed to be. Let us change the rules. And I understand where those people are coming from. A lot of those people are really advanced. They're thinking we need to change the whole procedure. But you know, people have been suggesting that in various ways since the late 60s, and a critical mass of American people, including engaged, enlightened ones, never quite get the message. I understand where our modern vanguard is coming from and hoping that we could really just turn everything upside down and change what we think of as progressive, as good, as smart, as moral. Folks, it's not gonna happen. And I'm not saying that as somebody who's 54. I was saying that when I was 34. Now, could that happen? I'd be on board with some of it, not most of it, but some of it, but it's just not gonna happen. And so we have to get rid of this idea that black people are gonna overcome via an overturning of how American society works. Not because that isn't an interesting idea, not because that isn't an idea that you can have and have an IQ of 180. That stuff can be really deep. It's not gonna happen. And if you insist on hoping that that's gonna happen, this white privilege business, you're gonna submit people to these EST style sessions and everybody's gonna realize that they are privileged and therefore are gonna go out and God knows what they're supposed to go out and do, but everything's gonna change. It's just not gonna work. Most people don't know that white fragility was, those sessions were being done way back in the early 1970s. So that, so I try to stay abreast of what people are thinking because I don't feel old yet, but I think that what we need to realize is that this idea that we shall overcome by overturning is not going to work. And it's not gonna work even if George Floyd's death was a truly terrible thing. That does not change anything. So that is our problem at this point. And if that makes me old, then I'm sorry, but I'm just old. But there are young people such as Coleman Hughes, mm. who is nowhere near 30, who would completely agree, and there's nothing wrong with him. He's not strange. He's just able to make sense. And now a message from Blinkist, the app that distills the essence from over 4,000 best-selling nonfiction books and brings them to you in 15-minute text and audio explainers. As part of my job at Quillette, I need to be conversant about what books my readers and listeners are talking about, in part because a lot of the authors of those books end up on this podcast. But life is busy. Blinkist lets me dive into a topic quickly and find out how to deploy my reading time best. Blinkist also has teamed up with popular podcast creators to blink those podcasts for you too. And yes, the company uses the word blink as a verb like that. It's a thing. By blinking a podcast, Using a feature called Shortcasts, you can get to the heart of an episode quickly, complete with high-quality audio. You can jump right in on the go during your commute, at the gym, around the house, or even download to listen offline. 15 million people are already using Blinkist to broaden their knowledge in 27 nonfiction categories, including self-improvement, personal growth, management, leadership, and mindfulness. And like I've told you before, the length of a typical Blinkist abridgment is just 15 minutes, about the length of time it takes me to walk my dog. Some of my recent favorites include The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator by Timothy C. Weingard, Becoming by Michelle Obama, and The AI Economy by Roger Boodle. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. 
Go to Blinkist.com slash Quillette to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Quillette to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Quillette. And now, back to our podcast. When you say that this is uh, this is our problem at, at the moment, there are so many problems at the moment. Uh, I don't think I've ever experienced a year which is as stressful and worrying as this one, not just because of the pandemic, but because of politics and uh, in addition to all of the things that we're talking about. And one critique that I hear a lot, that I get a lot towards myself and towards, I'm sure, people like you and institutions like Quillette and, and Think Inc. is like, why talk about this stuff? Why are you talking about this stuff when, okay, so, you know, the left's going a little bit too far. Someone on Twitter said to me last night, I really shouldn't be reading Twitter before going to bed. Someone someone said, uh, oh, sure, Josh, on the one hand, you have college kids maybe being a bit overboard on the PC thing, and on the other, you have a full-blown fascist takeover of the GOP, that of all the things you could be going after, to go after the extremes of uh, of people who basically fundamentally want justice and are on the right side of history is misguided when you could be going after people who are flagrantly in support of injustice and who hold the levers of power. Yep, that is always an interesting um, objection. And I, I get it. I get what they mean. But for one thing, it's not just a bunch of college students. It's, at this point, our entire intelligentsia, except for a few apostates. It is our entire artistic establishment not only intelligentsia, that only overlaps partially with our entire body of educational institutions. If that is not a crucial segment of society, and I'm quite aware of the alt-right, et cetera, but if that is not a crucial segment of society, then I'm not sure what world we're in. I think that a lot of people, either they really think that it's just a bunch of college students, in which, in which case they're mired in about 2015, or they are biased. Honestly, it's because they really agree with all of this stuff and they feel that we really need to pay attention to somebody who has a gun and, you know, goes into, you know, Portland or something like that. But no, it's this is real. And it's at the point where if this is the crucial thing, if we're going to have this leftist orthodoxy where everybody left of center and that's a much bigger group of people, everybody left of center pretends to agree with this stuff and pees their pants. And I've used that analogy before. I find it vulgar, but it frankly is accurate. All these people are peeing their pants because they're afraid of somebody calling them a racist. That's good in a way, but frankly, everybody needs to, to man up a bit. And I'm sorry that that expression is gendered. Person up, something. Because if that doesn't happen, then it's going to affect our polity it's going to affect politics. There are a great many people who are sick of being called racist and will never understand the nuances of terms like institutional racism and the new use of white supremacy. Can that affect votes? Who can say at this point? But it definitely creates a sense of us versus them, which wouldn't be there if we had a more sensible left of center, i.e. the one from about 15 years ago. You know, we're not waiting for some Valhalla. It's just that what's happening right now is vastly alienating a great many people. And I don't mean the ones who have guns. They're, they're, that's not pardonable. The issue is, what about a vote? You know, what about the general sense of who's on what side? And in general, the idea that we're in this country with all of its money and all of its power, and it's getting to the point that you're not allowed to think officially unless you pretend to subscribe to the simplicities of Robin D'Angelo and Ibram Kendi is a tragedy for trying to foster sophisticated thought. I shudder at the idea. I, a part of this, I must admit, talk about old, is my kids. I'm worried that my children are going to be exposed to this. I have to be careful. No, I'm not going to be careful. This nonsense. Nonsense. Over this calendar year in particular, we have watched a great many people pretend to subscribe to nonsense because they're afraid of being called a white supremacist. I find it pathetic, and I revile these people who don't have the courage to stand up for their own convictions 
and allow for something closer to sense. So yeah, now, do we have larger problems? I would say climate change is the larger problem. However, the idea that the violent right is more of a problem than this leftist consensus that basically is telling us that we need to be stupid in order to be morally enlightened, I think they're about equal. To tell you the truth, I also think I, it's a false choice. I think it's a false choice because I think that 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 stupid extremism begets stupid extremism, and you have a ratcheting up of both sides. I mean, my my standard response is like, a, I I talk about this stuff because I'm interested in it and I'm intellectually curious in it. So fuck off if you're not, but you don't have to listen listen to these conversations <laughs> if you don't want to. Uh, but also, I think that unless we're unless we're careful about creating about making sense with each other essentially then then you empower uh, you empower the far right so it's not like it's not like not criticizing this stuff uh you know is is going to create more uh, right wing extremism i think being i think you know what we've seen happening in the united states is likelier to get trump elected it's like i saw someone tweeting like all you have to do to to win the election democrats is don't riot like that's pretty much all you have to do <laughs> right at that at this point so what do we do then if you're right in your kind of construction of this, John, that it's essentially a, a, a religious thing now? You were talking about these indigenous words that have mystical meaning the way that the N-word now does, and that this is not a question of arguing with people about uh, about reasons. This is a question of sort of apostasy and, and piety and purity and subscription to a communal way of thinking. I mean, is there a... I sometimes wonder if there's a possible out in just granting to the Ibram Kendis of the world that, okay, if you want everything to be racist and anti-racist, I'll, I'll just be racist. Let's just say that the word racist now means everything, and so I'm racist. And then let's talk in a different in different language about what the actual problems we see with one another are or with, you know, prejudice and, and things like like that. Like, what is the way out of the Chinese finger puzzle of this faith? That was a really good analogy, and here is, here is the issue. And I haven't aired this that much, but the reason that I'm saying this is a religion is we have a basis for understanding that it has no place in the public square as something that we base governmental procedure or intellectual culture on. And so you can subscribe to Ibram Kendi and Robin D'Angelo's ideas all you want, just like you can be a Mormon. But the idea that we should have teachers bringing that stuff into classes to infect, and yes, I meant infect, children should be thought of as people bringing religion into the classroom, as people bringing religion into how a corporation runs things, people bringing religion into how we discuss political culture and sociocultural factors, because that's literally the way I think of it. At this point, I have realized to try to engage somebody constructively who has really fallen for all of this stuff is as impossible as trying to teach somebody not to have faith in Jesus. Literally, I don't mean that rhetorically. And so we need to get to the point where we understand that, say, Ibram Kendi is a priest. Really? I mean, in a way, I think he knows that he is. I'm not trying to paint him as some kind of demon. It's not that he's malevolent, but what he is is not an intellectual. He's a priest. And so we need to understand that those sorts of views may be interesting. You might decide to subscribe to them. But because they're not based solely on empirical fact, we can no more allow them to guide us in how we go about our lives if we're not religious like them, then we would allow Catholicism or Mormonism to pick you know, two things randomly to do the same thing. It's absolutely crucial that we realize that there are people called the elect. They don't call themselves that. They call themselves just people who have the truth. But then again, in say 1400, nobody was calling themselves religious mm. to believe in you know what Catholics believe, that was thought of as just what a smart person knew. There was no questioning of it in the public square. The word religious comes later than many people think. That's where we are now. So it doesn't matter that these super woke people wouldn't call themselves religious and often would revile fundamentalist Christians, etc. They are religious. And even though they're not going to admit it, 
and there are white ones and black ones. And to be honest, these days, I think more of the white ones. The book I'm writing is not an anti-black book. Frankly, it's my first anti-white book. Mm. These people are parishioners. And they won't admit it, but we have to understand that even if they don't admit it and even if it insults them, they are. And the reason that we have to insult them in that way is not just to enjoy insulting people. I don't like insulting people. It's that we have to have a guide. We have to have a watch cry so that we can understand why we cannot let this stuff infect. And yes, infect our discussions at Thanksgiving. And now a message from our commercial supporters at BetterHelp the online counseling service that helps people everywhere become happier and more productive. At BetterHelp.com, you'll connect with your professional licensed therapist in a safe, private, online environment using secure video, phone, online chat, or text. Anything you share is, of course, strictly confidential. While BetterHelp isn't a crisis line, new clients can start communicating with their counselor in under 24 hours. When self-help methods aren't enough and you seek professional counseling, BetterHelp can connect you to a network of thousands of licensed therapists. And you can switch therapists to make sure you get the right fit. Licensed counselors include specialists in sleep, trauma, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. So many people are using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 U.S. states. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling, there's no awkward waiting room, and you can message your BetterHelp counselor at any time. Financial aid is available in some cases. Join over one million others who are taking charge of their mental health by visiting BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, dot com. Quillette listeners get 10% off their first month service with the discount code Quillette. Just go to BetterHelp.com slash Quillette. And now, back to our podcast. You tell people, well, this is about religion and maybe we need to stop here because you think that you're going to live in the arms of Jesus and I don't. Nobody even tries to have a discussion about that. Or if you've tried, you do it once. I tried once. You know, and the person just kept on saying, well, you've got to have faith. You've got to have faith. You've mm -hmm. got to have faith. And I thought, mm -hmm. my God, to him, that has a meaning it'll never have to me. Discussion closed. It's the same way with all of this particular strain of wokeism, which says, for example, that to be black is that your defining trait is to be oppressed at the hands of white people and that it's all intersectional and that the only people who you can qualify and describe culturally are rapacious white people. All of that is like phlogiston. All of that is alchemy. We, most of us know it. We need to reject it as what it is and as civilly as we can, just try to work around the elect. We're not going to get rid of them. What I want the elect to do is sit down. It's not that I think that there shouldn't be hard left people like that at the table teaching us how things could be. That is part of how we move along. We need our elects. But something happened after George Floyd where the elect stood up and started shouting everybody down. I want them to sit the fuck down where they were so that they are one of many groups. And I'm sorry for the profanity, but I meant precisely that. I don't want them to sit down. I want them to sit the fuck down. <laughs> Spoken only as a linguist could say it. Uh, John McWhorter, it's an absolute <laughs> delight to talk to you. I uh, look forward to the day when we can have some uh, some fried chicken together after this brutal pandemic is, uh, is over. Um, Thank you so much for your time. What's going to happen now if you're viewing is if you have tickets to the after party or if you have tickets to the private salon uh, with John, uh, you'll be able to access those uh, basically instantly, but those will commence in about 10 minutes' time. You will have received a Zoom link in your email. Uh, if you're not going to those, but if you've just been tuning in, keep your eye on, uh, on future events like this. It'll be a roughly monthly occurrence and, occurrence and we've got some amazing special guests lined up. I'm Josh Sepps. Go and find my podcast, Uncomfortable Conversations with Josh Sepps, where you have conversations uh, almost as good, but not quite as good as uh, this one. And wherever you are in the world, have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events.